I want to be remembered as a good dad, a good friend, and these are the things that matter, really, mm. you know. That's where you get your energy from. Mm. And, yeah. and on the past, they have become rich. <laughs> Why not? Why not? It's very practical, right? <laughs> I think this is success. You know, just enjoy what you're doing. You reach this thing. Okay, move to the next one, next level. Just as okay. investors, as other asset class, we assume certain risk. Mm -hmm. It's part of our life. We try to minimize it by doing a very good assessment of that and compare it with the potential upside. Mm -hmm. the, the larger the upside, the better, of course. The potential upside, the better. When something goes wrong, it's usually about something about the people. Mm. It's not about, so it has to be about something that we didn't assess well in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to learn and you have to stick to your investment thesis, how you perceive limitations. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is very important, you know. Yeah. I don't want to be just an IT guy, employee with 2,000 euros per month, uh, changing from one company to the other every six months. Mm. Well, actually, I can make it much bigger. Hello, Recursive community, and welcome back to Bucharest. I'm very excited about our next guest because he has been participating very actively in the development of the Romanian ecosystem from its very inception. First, as an angel investor, today, Dan Mihaescu is the founding partner of Gapminder VC, which is one of the first EAF-funded VCs in Romania. He has led Gapminder's investments at companies like Fintech OS, Typing DNA, Card Loop, SciScale, and Druid AI, some very promising startups. Before that, Dan was seasoned business executive with experience in small and medium and also large enterprises in M&A and venture acceleration. Dan is also an INSEAD alumni and a Harvard Business School graduate. Dan Michaesco, welcome to the Recursive Podcast. Thank you. So it's been a very interesting week. I was wondering, you know, for someone who has been part of the Romanian ecosystem and has helped very actively, you know, building it, now looking at it from the perspective of, you know, how to web and it's bubbling and Absolutely. there's all sorts of people, international guests coming from all over to experience that and to see the startups which are here. How do you feel about that? So I have uh, actually a mostly positive uh, feelings about it. I also aware of the moment when we are doing this. It's uh, September 2022. Mm. It's uh, just probably before a uh, big crisis. Yes. So we have to put that into context. Now, like in 2018, we started to uh, invest with uh, GameMinder and with Tech Accelerator, which is our accelerator program. And at the beginning, of this the, the ecosystem was really very poor in terms of financing, in terms of actual top quality of the teams, of the pitches and all that. And right now you see after a few years that the teams have evolved, they became more focused, they understood, started to understand what the investors are looking for. Mm -hmm. So the conversations are much more meaningful. Uh, if you tell to somebody, hey, I have, look, I have only two minutes for this, I need to really jump into that, but I'm curious to hear what you're doing. Uh, they are, uh, right now they are able to articulate those things. Yes. So previously it was like no way, no chance. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess it is a sign of evolution when the entire ecosystem of startups are getting more educated in the way to interact with their clients, with investors, with media and everybody. So it's a sign of evolution. Mm. On the other hand, I see lots of, uh, at this moment, and probably we'll talk about it, this moment we, it's crazy we, uh, in terms of uh, what's going on and we probably, none of us knows what is really going on in terms of macroeconomics, in terms of how this will influence the ecosystem. But what we see is that lots of investors are reaching out towards Central European countries. Mm. They see the potential, the evolution. Somehow they have a bit too high expectations for the status of the ecosystem yes. and the maturity of the startups and all that. Um, but it's interesting that they're coming here, reaching out, they grabbing their intel, yeah. they're looking at what's going on, and it's in many ways it's very easy. It will be very easy in the near future to go to all these investors. And, uh, you know, reach out, uh, pitch your startup and all that. And also for us as uh, VCs in Central Europe, it's much easier to build up more relationships 
into you know strong uh, strongholds of the VC ecosystem like London or uh, New York or San Francisco. It's so, easier than ever before, actually. Yes. Yeah. I think it's a very good time. You know, yeah. Of course, we are currently in an economic downturn, but I'm thinking that. We have been in the economic downturn in Southeast Europe for how many years now? Yeah, what how crisis? Many decades? <laughs> what crisis? So I think that somehow maybe entrepreneurs are used to this kind of situation. They are very, you know, robust. Yeah. Um, yes. Bootstrapped. They have this bootstrapped. mindset of being bootstrapped. Yes. What I see is the difference is that they started to learn what uh, they don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's something that I feel it changed also over the years. So by if you do the profiling of most of the, so you do, obviously there are exceptions and outliers, but same thing actually. But you look like, what is the profile of a, a founder uh, in Central Europe, and especially in this part of Central Europe? Mm-hmm. The founders are mostly technical profile. Yes. Started to have uh, business experience, started to have high ambitions. Mm-hmm. And of course, we are in, and they have this part of the mentality that is, uh, I want to go global, which is absolutely exceptional. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think it over, I mean. But was it like that, let's say, five years ago? Isn't it the success stories of, you know, some founders? So, so they yes. actually started to evolve more and more. You see that uh, more and more teams, first of all. So it evolved in this way. They they understood that they need to build up strong teams from the beginning. Mm-hmm. They understood that they build, need to build those teams based on a vision that is ambitious and it's like a Viking type of ambition. Yeah, I need to conquer other t- territories, other t- whatever. So they have to have that from the beginning. And th- when they build that, they add in their teams people that actually do have some business experience. Mm-hmm. The education school uh, education system in Central Europe and exceptionally in in, in, uh, in mostly in in Romania it's very good at abstract sciences, uh, maths, uh, physics, uh, IT, and all that. But it's not that good on business side. Mm-hmm. So people start to specialize on business or learn business in university actually, not in high school. True. So you lack that uh, that experience from early age. Um, so what it means is that once you go to the university, you're already specializing your future, specializing yourself as Mm -hmm. a professional. Mm -hmm. So the result, coming back to the founders, right? The result is that we actually need, you see the specialization co-founders, right? Certain founders are technical and they, they learn business and certain co-founders are actually business and specialized in their you know, enthusiasts about the technology that they are bringing out, the new business models that are bringing out. So you see this mix. Mm-hmm. And um, what about the marketing and the sales skills? Because in the early beginning, you have to be really proactive about telling your story. You know, mm-hmm. being engaging. Mm-hmm. It's important to raise capital. You know, to convince in, in investors. It's important to have like really the top talent on your on your team and even, even the co-founding team. Mm. And then later on, of course, you know, when you approach new markets, how do we perform in this regard? It's improving. It's improving. It's improving. Yeah. And there's also this fact, I mean, education is one part, but uh, the hands-on education is really the most important part. So we, over the years, we got a generation of g- founders that tried things, maybe failed, probably failed if, mm. if they changed uh, to a new project. Uh, so they didn't give up. They took all the experience they got and moved to the new project and brought the knowledge they got. I'm actually curious exactly about this spillover effect. So Gapmander was one of the first funds and it was back then probably part of the Jeremy program. And I guess a lot of founders, they, you know, just got the taste of entrepreneurship. Uh, They were like first time founders. Maybe they would never have businesses before. Many of them probably failed, but in a way, you know, they got excited about this thing and then tried again and then tried again. Do you see that spillover effect now into in fruition? Yes, I see. So the ones that were... uh... So it takes time to build something, right? So mm. the ones that were successful, they continue to do that. 
sometimes they realize that maybe they are not enough for the business they are building and they need to bring even more senior people with deep knowledge of other marketing product marketing let's say yes. and maybe they expand it to London and then to uh, New York, let's say. Mm -hmm. And they realize that they need people from there with that knowledge, deep knowledge, very senior, that can shortcut the, mm -hmm. the trace to success. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the good cases where they, they were successful and they were wise enough to understand they need very senior people around them and they need to build a company. When they started, they built a project. Mm -hmm. From a project, they kind of turned it into a business and then they need to scale it to a real company. Okay, yes. so this is a different thing. Now, the guys do, that did not succeed back then are actually starting to either st starting their own thing and found, find co-founders either joining uh, startups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's also a spillover of the uh, success story of UiPath. There are lots of professionals that That's, are really good. That's one of my questions. Yeah. I'm wondering now, oh. it's been a while. And mm. of course, first of all, they showed that the global ambition is actually possible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. second of all, they show that, um, you know, how to, how to build a company like that. So I think they're going to be probably be more like the PayPal mafia, you know, people who are part of UI. Like inside mafia. Yeah. Or the inside yeah, mafia yeah. that we're going to also talk about. I'm very curious about this one. So they're going to, you know, spread a certain mindset and also business acumen of how to build a global company because before that, yeah. Very few people had this kind of experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right? Yeah. So what has changed since they became a unicorn and later on a decocorn? Do you see? Oh, for the Romanian ecosystem. For the Romanian ecosystem. Well, first of all, we've got a unicorn. So this is, it was mm. amazing, you know. So we always thought we are so much behind the, all the other ecosystems, mm. even Bulgaria, even Hungary and all those. But you were the first actually here in the region, you know, it's, yeah. it's Bulgarian and Greece and, and, and the others who yeah, followed. So, so yeah, so you first, then, the, yeah, uh, Payhawk would, uh, so... I think Viva Wallet was before that in, ah, okay, in, in right. Greece and Infobip, I'm not quite sure when they got the unicorn status in, in Croatia. So these are like the first stories, but yeah. you were the first one. Yeah, yeah. so it, I think it was a wake-up call. If you think it over, it was a moment at which the IT industry... Uh, well, it was focusing on outsourcing the type of services, right? Mm. And then you see that, wow, this is a product company born in, in Romania with Romanian DNA. It's not a Romanian uh, um, company per se right, anymore, of course. It's, you know. Yeah, but it makes sense you but, know, for, but for the market it, that they're serving. But they yeah. did it. I yes. mean, they did it. There is a team that was so courageous to do this thing, and uh, they managed to attract uh, huge talent around them. Mm -hmm. uh, they attracted some very good investors, you know, Dan, uh, mm -hmm. Lupu, Early Bird, uh, yes. Cre Andre, Bartosz, uh, Credo Ventures. Yes. In the very early days, this, this, this mix of talent, uh, guts, trust, and, uh, you know, extra uh, wisdom and money from the investors were a very powerful mix that was not seen ever before in the Romanian ecosystem, sure. right? Sure. So this is like, wow, everybody waking up, oh, I, this is possible, I can do it, mm. you know? So it's like, like the education, you know, if you get a get good education, finally, if you're smart enough, you realize that it's about, okay, how do, how do I perceive limitations, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I can change things. So this is what UiPath has done really for the Romanian Making ecosystem. this kind of success within our reach and yeah. in a way also boosting the confidence of founders yeah. that And changing this, this, how you perceive limitations. Mm -hmm. this, this is very important, you know? Yeah. I don't want to be just an IT guy, employee with 2,000 euros per month, uh, changing from one company to the other every six months. Mm -hmm. Well, actually I can make it much bigger. Right, so I, it's it's funny. It's very much true. I think before that we weren't even perceiving this kind of limitations, but it was like our ambition was capped. Like yeah, there was a glass yeah, ceiling. Yeah. Success is like, oh, I, I'm I'm an IT guy, great career. I can work everywhere and from anywhere. I can get money. I can get a nice car, a nice house. I can help my parents. I whatever. And then I would achieve, you know, all the checklist, and I would be happy. You know, yeah, and probably, money. yeah, but probably, okay. and probably there are still people like that. But this thing changed. This mm. thing changed, and then other stories followed. And 
um, we are happy that we are part of those stories. We, we discovered uh, FinTech OS very early. We invested in the first year that we, we, we were with the fund. Was Sergio already back then, uh, Sergio, in a good part of the team? Yeah, yes. they, both, both mm -hmm. Doro and Sergio. Yes. The other leaders, Sergio and Good. Yes. Um, Sergio is also part of the INSEAD Mafia. mafia. Uh, I'm coming the... back, you know, to this question. I wanted to ask you about that. Um, oh, okay. Education, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, for someone who is in Bucharest, you actually have a, a very good education, I have to say. So you, you're an alumni of INSEAD, which we know is one of the best networks globally for, yeah. um, for business and MBA alumni. And, you went even further, you decided, okay, so I'm going to probably do venture capital, I'm going to get like a proper education, and you did that at Harvard Business School. Yeah. I still wonder, what is the value of, you know, having that in your CV? Is it a CV thing? Is it actual mm. good education, or is it all about the networks? The CV thing, it's important in uh, certain stages of the life. Mm. Uh, so, I realized, so you need it in that stage of the life, obviously. So it, it gets you where you need to get, gets you the foundations of a lot of things, and you start making correlations. You, you get a great network of people, and we all are influenced by the people we have around, and it's driven off, it's driving the way we develop as, as persons, as uh, business people. Uh, it's very important, this network. I actually and, believe that, you know, but, the, but maybe yes. the thing that, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. maybe it's something that I just said earlier. The one thing that helps you all this mix, you know, of uh, fundamentals and technicalities and network of people is, you know, having conversations and going and doing things that are ambitious. And what it changes, if you do, if you go to a good, good business school, it changes you in the way you perceive exactly those limitations and you say, hey, maybe maybe I should go to private equity. Hey, maybe I should go to McKenzie or Roland Berger or mm. maybe I should continue to educate myself in such environments, mm. right? Where I, I, I am exposed to lots of experience. I can learn within three years uh, what other people are learning in a lifetime. And let's see how it goes. Mm. Uh, you in interact with instantly with only good people, super smart people, different temperaments of course and personalities, but you interact with very interesting people right there. And look at what happens. I mean the startup ecosystem. We are mm. really privileged if yes. you think it from that perspective. Lots yeah. of ambitious people, super smart. Uh, they're trying to build something for the future. But I think the privilege is also responsibility, and I think yeah. you are also very aware of that because the yeah. INSEAD network that you you have you know built, which was in a way trying to give back to the community, yeah, um, is exactly an example of that. So, how many members do you have at this point, and what is the what is the purpose? What is the mission of uh, globally? I don't know. I'm so I'm a member of the global INSEAD, and yes. uh, in Romania, I think we are in the range of 83 plus, uh, I don't know, maybe 40 something that mm -hmm. did uh, uh, various executive programs. Yes. Um, uh, but we, we, we will keep close. Mm -hmm. And then there are lots of Romanians that finished uh, inside and there are in other parts of the world, mostly, I don't know, London or, uh, yes. yeah. yeah. Yes, they're still spread. Do you find, you know, meaningful ways to give back to, to Romania, to contribute to the economic development of Romania? We tried. Yes. Yeah, we tried. It's mm -hmm. not always easy to try to help. Okay. Not in <laughs> all these countries, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but we tried a lot of, I mean, simple things like uh, when the Ukrainian war started and crisis started, you know, crisis meaning the there are so many people that the refugees, yeah, yes. Yeah, just, wow. So we, we try to help. And mm. we, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we tried to promote to certain contacts the use of certain software for identifying the guys that were, uh, yeah, whatever, um, providing. Even we, we tried to provide uh, help through Xvision. It's a startup in which we invested. And mm -hmm. it, it was used in 42 hospitals for secondary uh, triage, uh, 
Yes. Uh, using, uh, you know, the um, uh, X-rays and MRIs mm -hmm. uh, on lung. So, okay. so they use artificial intelligence to identify like eight uh, things that can happen to your lungs, basically going towards the direction of uh, lung cancer. But this was used actually in a secondary triage for uh, COVID, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it was automated. It was a, it is a red flag tool that uh, basically helps the professionals to to identify. Oh, okay, this guy really has something in his lung. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a higher priority case. Yes. And imagine those times. Imagine the you know the health workers. Let's say mm -hmm. they were overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. So yeah. getting an extra tool to kind of automati automatize mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that was really helpful. Yeah. Right? So we, we provided that. And actually, there was somebody inside the, inside the alumni association that uh, uh, helped to open certain doors so this technology could be used fast. So there is fast track. Don't use a typical bureaucratic type of way of getting into the... This is also important, you know. Yeah. Uh, if you want to help, you also need someone on the other side who wants to be helped and who's yeah. going to, you know, be an internal champion. So I saw also that you have a technical background. You actually studied <laughs> I, at yeah, the yeah, university. Yeah. It was, of course, in different times, but yeah, does it help you to be now a better VC in the tech, you know, sphere? It might. I mean, I, it should help. I mean, look, the best VCs that I see around... Uh, and we maybe are in, in some cases we are in the same board are the ones that are really capable of understanding the details of the business uh, mm. the guys that are uh, uh, capable of zooming in zooming out of the, the topics fast mm -hmm. uh, and be supportive for their teams um, so Part of it is, of course, also this technical knowledge. At least you understand what it can do and what it cannot do, the potential for doing it, how it can be secured in certain aspects, how it can help to differentiate in a business uh, model or the uh, product setting. So it helps to know uh, the technical part. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a, a coder, really. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mostly, probably you need to understand systems, architecture of systems and things, or, or be a gamer, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I actually met just now at How to Web a, a guy that I was amazed about. He, he's a specialized VC in, in uh, fintech, mm -hmm. but he's actually absolutely an obsessed gamer. And this <laughs> is helping him to understand certain models wow. uh, yeah, okay. based on reward and gamification. So it's like, wow. That's, you, okay. you never know that how, how this can help you. You would connect me to him. I would be very curious, you know, to find his story. Yeah, sure. By the way, but you still had a very good executive career. Yeah. Why? Why did you change? Isn't that crazy? I mean, you were already at a level where you would. It's about because... perceiving limitations. You know, yeah. you get you get these iterations in your life. So, you, you, of course, you, you have to grow, you have to be committed to what you do. Right? How did you perceive that as growth? You could have, you know, probably become some kind of manager for whole Europe and then for, you know, globally. Isn't that, you know, the usual path? Why would you then go to mm. venture capital? Something which was... There were a few point, steps yeah? between the decision to do it and the decision to and the, the doing it. it. Tell me about so it. I was back then a country manager of a telecom and data center company mm. in, in uh, here in Romania. So I was country manager for Romania, Bulgaria and Moldova, actually. Yes. So it was international. Uh, a UPC? No. No, we no, this was GTS. To... A GTS, a GTS, yes, GTS, true, GTS, true. GTS Telecom. Yes. And this was part of a group, and we had three waves of private equity behind us mm. in time, in 10 years. So we were sold and we exited as management a few times together with the investors. I see. So I was always looking at these guys that were at the other side of the table, super smart. And you decided to super. go on the dark side. <laughs> no, I'm joking, of course. Yeah, it could be seen like that in some <laughs> cases, I guess. I, I mean, I heard various stories in the private equity space, but uh, like everybody. Yes. But um, I was thinking, ah, oh, these guys are, oh, it's an amazing model. What fascinated you about venture capital? Which is the best part of the you know, investment process or the best part of your day, let's say. Yeah. 
Well, I think it is. Um, there are a few actually. Mm -hmm. One is uh, that moment when you click with the with the startup and you understand that oh, this can be something. Wow, I, I really need to dig further into this. I really want this. I really want this. So that moment is probably the best part. It's part of the. So maybe it's part of the selection pipeline, the selection process in the pipeline. Is it the founders that make you, you know, get fascinated? Is it the, you know, the, the it's human It's a combination, component? yeah, but yeah, oh, it's absolutely okay. important, absolutely. Yes. So it's that, and that's one moment. And the second one, the second moment I like is after the deal is signed, money are in, and we all like drinking a glass of whiskey. So it's like, ah. And now it starts. No, it's, <laughs> you know, we celebrate this, especially in the news. You know, the recursive. We write a lot mm -hmm. about deals, and it's perceived like, okay, they made it. But in reality, this is where it becomes even harder because now you have the investors. Now you have to fulfill certain expectations. You know, they're you know you, you pitch something to them. You are committed to achieving certain goals. Yeah. And now you actually have to execute them as well. So. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, it's a short moment of celebration, actually. Yeah. And then the work so starts. It is, it is, yeah, now it starts. So it's like always, you know, oh, I achieved this. Okay, so what now? Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, next level. Next level. Next level. So, and yeah. So I, I really love that moment. You see the interaction and the faces and, you know, usually it has... It's like oh, celebrating is like, you know... Uh, I have to do this and this and that and that. You see on their faces, you know. Yes. Have you had the feeling, you know, in a moment like that when you start seeing the interactions and how they behave that you thought, oh my God, that was a mistake. <laughs> have you had this? Well, or? we've seen mistakes, but uh, we are not lucky to see them so fast. So mm. those ones that we saw we, maybe happened after a few few months after. Mm. Okay, so. Which were the pitfalls, the most common pitfalls that you saw. So you signed a deal. At first, you were very excited about the, the startup and the entrepreneurs. And then from the perspective of the VC, how do you see the failing part? Can you maybe... So look, look, we, we, we were in a risk-based uh, 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 business compared by with other businesses as okay. investors, as other asset class. So we assume certain risk. Mm -hmm. It's part of our life. We try to minimize it by doing a very good assessment of that and compare it with the potential upside. Mm -hmm. the, the larger the upside, the better, of course, the potential upside, the better. Um, when something goes wrong, it's usually about something about the people. Mm. It's not about, so it has to be about something that we didn't assess well in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to learn and you have to stick to your investment thesis and your not to do list, mm -hmm. especially related people. Okay. okay. Maybe you can experiment a, a new business model. Or maybe you can experiment even a different segment, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, here in Central Europe, most of the funds we are obliged to be rather generalist than specialized. Okay. Sure. So you can experiment with those, but if you have a not to do list. Most of those items on it, the red flags, are related mm -hmm. to people. And that's where the things can go wrong. Can you name a few? I would be very curious. Red flags? Yeah. Which are the red flags? Or Single founder. Okay. Uh, boyfriend, girlfriend. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same... And maybe the only co-founders. Okay. That's a risk you're taking, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um People that are coming directly from a big corporate into the mm. entrepreneurship life and they don't really know what it is. It's mm -hmm. entrepreneurship is really very sexy to them. It's like something very new and fresh. It's but hyped. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, maybe these are three, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to understand the very beginning. So it took us a while to, to actually start putting questions like, you know, so tell me, how did you start this company? How did you think about it? Mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know why we didn't put the questions in the very first months of the fund, I, I, because it's so simple. So once we started to put the questions, we started to understand the dynamics between themselves and how they perceive themselves. And uh, yeah. So you kind of spot also the moments of vanity, like 
They want to be in that because they want to be cool, because it's sexy, because it's... Might, might be that. Uh, maybe they have very different ambitions mm -hmm. uh, or maybe they are fully mm -hmm. aligned. They, they want to make it absolutely big. Or mm -hmm. maybe you can spot out the fact that they don't have very high ambitions. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem for a VC, I mean, yeah, so... True, true. Yeah. But <laughs> I think, you know, for many of us, it's kind of typical when we come from this part of, you know, Europe. We still like the confidence. Um, it's uh, probably also a task for all of us yeah. to, you know, push our ambitions further. I remember at some point, you know, we started the whole thing and there was something some things in the industry that were really pissing me off and mm. we need some kind of innovation we need to change the business model of media mm. and i thought well someone will do it you know another big business you know media outlet a global one or maybe linkedin will kind of you know change it and then i thought but Irina, wait a second why wouldn't you think about that yeah why would you you know wait for someone big to do it maybe you can find an answer, you can experiment mm -hmm. and build something. Maybe it wouldn't be perfect, but it, you can at least try. Why are you capping your ambitions? Yeah, yeah. And I caught myself in that. And it, before that, it was very natural. Yeah, we're going to do something and it's never been so great as, uh, I don't know, <laughs> someone yeah. in the Silicon Valley or Tel Aviv yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So I guess it's a, it's a work for both of us. And I guess also the investors can contribute to that, you know, push founders' ambitions into something which is bigger, see if there is the potential and tell, there hey, is... actually, there is a bigger market for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but still, you want those that have it already in them and it's beyond the declarative uh, level, okay. Okay. okay? Still, that is the preferred version. Mm -hmm. uh, if you push it, uh, they might say, yes, whoa, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they want to try it, but all they want is just to try it. Okay. It's a difference between wanting, willing to try and being driven, mm -hmm. being really driven to do things, mm -hmm. really wanting to make a unicorn. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's interesting. I mean, some of the companies that you mentioned there, we, we are having these conversations uh, mm -hmm. in the board among, you know, with the entrepreneurs, the founders, and and among ourselves. How can you get it to that level when it is, I don't know, one billion? Uh, when, when will be, maybe, it's a discussion, not if, but when mm -hmm. we, we could do uh, around that one billion valuation. Yeah. It's a discussion about when and how. And mm -hmm. this is a question, it's also a question I learned from somebody else, I'm honest, but I really loved the, the question I put to, in many cases to the, to the founders. Mm -hmm. So how can you, how big can this be? How can you drive this, do this to grow this to 100 million euro mm -hmm. revenues mm -hmm. yearly, right? Because if it is 100 million, it's obviously above mm -hmm. 1 billion yeah. in valuation. It's a simple question. And you see how they think and if they ever thought about it. Mm -hmm. And you see who in the team is answering this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I can agree with that. Um, at the same time, Investing in early stage is also at a phase where the company maybe is, has not pivoted to the moment where they can actually really do it. Yeah. So they start with, with an idea, with a vision, and then sometimes we see products you know, being pivoted so many times so that the initial idea was totally different than in the That's end true. what, what went global. We have one in, in our portfolio that did just that, and it's really good. It's way more successful. So <coughs> it's very true about the early stage companies. Mm. Um, but you still have to see how they're thinking and if they're thinking. Okay. And you, you also want to start them to think about it, and you know, because that's what will drive them. True, true. Yeah. Probably so, ask the right questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, kick a certain yeah. kind of mindset. But it's true, in early early stage investment, you, you have to be, deal with many other things than this. Mm -hmm. But this is a very good thing to find out, you know. How do you really measure the potential of early stage startups? We know that, you know, the founding team plays a, a big role. It yeah. is much about mindset. And still, there are also certain markers that we're looking at, like size of the market, maybe. Yeah. 
or ability to innovate internally. Mm -hmm. How do you measure that from the VC perspective? Do you, I guess you follow also certain analytical patterns. I would like, you know, to explore a bit more about the process. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, I would say this is not as amazingly standard process or hyper-specialized process once you're a generalist. Okay. Uh, fun because you have to understand and learn new business models all the time. Mm. If you are generalists, right? So yes. if you are a fintech focused fund, you know all the sub segments and all that. There's ten sub segments of fintech, right? Or twelve, whatever you use, and you are specialized on that and you do decisions very fast, right? Mm. It's not the case with the funds in Central Europe, by mm. the way, because we have to learn, in most cases new new business models and we have to discover patterns among those okay. so of course we have certain affinity and us as a fund we we do b2b we want deep tech platform uh, part of it we want global ambitions and all that so we have certain criteria that we look and mm. search for and the way we search for it's uh, of course conversational with the you know conversational manner with the with the team mm -hmm. but we also try to learn what it is out there in the market and okay. uh, compare benchmark and all that understand how big is the market really not the one slide that they discovered uh, on i don't know McKinsey study or whatever right mm -hmm. we don't we don't eat that. We, we really need to okay. to search for that. So, at least in our case, we have so Robert. You... Robert that does uh, a lot of uh, research on these things. Mm -hmm. So, we get it. And uh, we try to see, ah, okay, so this is the potential. Then from there, it's like <clears throat> a combination between what is the ambition level, assuming certain risk, um, uh, there are certain methodologies that are used in the VC world. Uh, you obviously knew, know and heard about them. There's the VC mode, mm -hmm. VC method, is the options method. There are benchmarking methods, like three of them that's based on statistic uh, uh, models. Mm -hmm. and, you know, like oh, in this vertical, in this geography, uh, zero revenues, what's the benchmark? <laughs> <You> know, <so. laughs> <laughs> and you get you get that intel by the way okay. there are tools there are tools for that um, how important is intuition i was having... I, I was coming to that yeah. because what we do is not like you know uh, artificial intelligence type of of course artificial intelligence can be used for tools to grab things select and all that mm -hmm. and prioritize lots of things so you don't get cluttered but um at the end of the day, what we do we all, it's, I think it's a craft. It's not like a job or thing, you know, it's a craft. You, you learn it in time, you get, you develop this capability to understand patterns and to, to, to identify things. And people are calling it maybe experience. Other people are calling it the intuition. Mm -hmm. The problem is where you draw a line and what is the risk versus potential that you, you, you're gonna, uh, potential upside that you're gonna assume. Yeah. And for that price, and how bad do you want it? Mm -hmm. Because you might be in situations when, you know, the, the founder just uh, loves you and he's okay with everything. And there are situations when they like, oh, no, I don't accept this and that and that. And you have to manage those situations because at the end of the day, after that negotiation is gone, you have to live together, mm. right? It's like a marriage. It's like you have to live together for many years maybe five to six years until you do an exit. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know, 70% of the marriages in Romania. So, For me, one of the paradoxes in this kind of you know complicated relationship is that you still want to see a founder who is coachable, who is listening to feedback, but at the same time, you want them to be the captain of their ship. Yeah. And it's a very, very blurred line between the two. So if right. you have someone who is stubborn and they know always best and they're not listening to your questions or, you know, inputs that you're giving from the perspective of someone who has an overview of the whole market, mm. then it's got to be a red flag. But at the same time, maybe if they're too... Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah you, get, you have to find the right yes. place. <laughs> you have to find the right what place. Is, what is like for, if we have, if we admit that we have like probably a lot of founders now listening, how do you know that you're on the healthy side of being coachable by your investors in the early stage? We're not speaking about Series A or Series B. Yeah. The role of those investors is different. A bit, yeah. Mm. 
so I think it is about um, you know the conversation you 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 actually drive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They present and they they are the most vocal into the conversation, but actually you drive the conversation, you help the conversation because you have the objective. They have obviously the objective to convince you that it's a good fit. They is the founders. The founders okay. But you have the objective to actually understand what is there without mm-hmm. being really heavily emotional or anything. Mm-hmm. You're just judging in a way, assessing all the time, everything. So what you do is, uh, in most of the cases, you put questions that are a bit challenging for them and okay. see how they react and how they think. And if, if they are right, oh, absolutely, I mean, you get it. If they are wrong and they keep on justifying and all that, you, maybe there is something there. Maybe there is an issue, an ego issue or whatever it is, or lack of understanding, whatever it is. So you have to be very careful, but you have to pay attention in all conversations and how they react to these things. And after you, after a while, you know, trust is built in time. So once you get the trust, you, it's way easier. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like in every relationship. Yeah, it's is, way easier. Is ego a good or a bad thing, you know? Both. You know, ambitious startup? Yeah, it's both. both. Oh, absolutely. I mean, ego, it's a major driver, a major engine. Mm-hmm. But you have to be able to, to control it. Mm-hmm. You have to be able not to be arrogant and basically bring everybody else down and you are the guy who knows everything. You, you have mm-hmm. to listen. You have to, yeah, you really, you really have to be humble, you know, you, mm-hmm. strong ego, but humble, it's... It's a rare combination. It's a, yeah. a sign of maturity. Yeah, it's, <laughs> if you look at the most performant uh, startups, you, you will see that the, the founders are uh, above 38 uh, years mm. old. That's, and of course, there are outliers that are, you know, like 35 or all that. But um, yeah, mm. it's very interesting uh, that in the startup world and in the venture capital world, we speak a lot about technologies and innovation. But mm. in its core, there is a lot of psychology in the whole thing. Yeah, it's a lot of mindset. I had a friend earlier who was like a professional poker player. <laughs> and it was never about the poker. It was never about the game. It was mm. all about, you know, developing your mind and yeah. knowing how to, you know, be on the, on the healthy side of <laughs> yeah. competition. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> so having had great education, having had a very promising and, you know, um, very rich executive career in corporate, yeah. having been now in venture capital for how many years are now? Seven oh, or eight? No. We, yeah. st- we started to operate in uh, 2018. 18. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is success for you? Well, uh, How would you know that, yeah, now I reach success? Is success important to you at all? Yeah, it's a strong driver for everybody, I think. Mm. The way you perceive success is probably different. Yes. But um, at least for me and the, uh, the, the guys in the team, it's uh, really about, you know, getting that thing done and then we move on to the next level. So mm-hmm. we are never, like, going to stop now and... We are fully satisfied and we stop, just relaxed. We made it. Mm-hmm. So success, I think it's a process. It's not like an end game. It's about the road, you know. And that's when you make things big. I mean, <clears throat> I was talking to a guy who runs marathons and it is, it, and I hate, I hate running actually. And <laughs> this guy is telling me, man, what makes the difference is if you enjoy running, you, mm-hmm. you will go the distance, you'll try even uh, 100 miles. Uh, that's, if you enjoy, you'll go further than the guy that just wants the prize. True. So, and uh, I, I think after a few years, I think he got it from a motivational YouTube clip or something. And he was telling me this, but you know, it was true. I mean, it is true. So I think this is success, you know, just enjoy what you're doing, you reach this thing, okay, move to the next one, next level. Mm. Yeah. I remember another story. I can't remember the name of the guy, but um, he was actually running in order to 
um, fundraise donations for cancer patients because his brother, I think, died from cancer. Wow. And he was yeah. one of the best, you know, runners somewhere in the Sahara at the age of 70 or 80, really wow. late age. Wow. And that was actually what kept him pushing. It was the good cause. Um, so I always wonder what is the best motivation. I, I guess for many it's also vanity. It's the need to prove ourselves that we're worthy, that uh, that we're seen. Yeah. Especially in the early ages, it is like that. Um, when you have done variety of experiences, the perception of success changes a lot. Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. Then Age. you realize how important it is to have fun in the process. Yeah. <laughs> um, I still, I truly believe in this you know, method where you visualize that moment yeah, that you're running towards, yeah. if we use the metaphor. Do you have this in Gapmind or do you have like a, like a vision which is for the next 10 years? Yeah, I think we do. I think we want to be one of the most important funds in Southeastern Europe. Mm. And uh, I think we, we're going to do it. I mean, mm. it looks like we are on a good track. Uh, we are looking at our uh, uh, current fund, which is the first fund, and we look at the portfolio in the first fund. We look at uh, how we see the fundraising for the second fund. Mm. Uh, and looking at the portfolio here, it's like, wow, we really do have some very good companies this in our true. portfolio. And um, wow. I am looking already forward uh, to the next success story. So we're, we've been waiting for them. <laughs> yeah. I know it's a different climate in, right now. In, <laughs> in two weeks, we'll announce uh, another investment. It's the, 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 uh, we respect the, what we agreed. So okay, they, yeah. they, they're going to announce it in two weeks. They want to have a, So, you, of course, you, you will know. connect us. <laughs> in this context, you know, wanting to be one of the most successful funds in Southeast Europe, or let's say Central and Eastern Europe, maybe I can, you know, think of another ambition. What do you personally want to be remembered for? What would be your oh, contribution? Pff, I, that doesn't matter that much. I mean, no. Really, see, I, really, I don't think... Uh, many years ago I gave up this, uh, I decided to not give up, I decided that it's not for me to be famous in any way. Mm. Right, and I have a friend that you might know him actually that has a say, and I really like that. So I, I, I would r rather be rich than famous any day. <laughs> so I really like that. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a good actually mindset for a venture capitalist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, if I want to be remembered, I. Yeah, I want to be remembered as a good dad, a good friend, and these are the things that matter, really, mm. you know. That's where you get your energy from. Mm. And, yeah. and on the path there, become rich. <laughs> Why not? Why not? It's very practical, right? <laughs> this is about perceiving limitations, right? It's true, it's yeah. true. Dan, thank you so much for this thank conversation you. and being our guest here. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for inviting me. Looking forward again to the next success stories in your portfolio. I think you thank have you. very interesting companies thank you. with exceptional founders. And we will keep track of your progress. <laughs> thank you. Next on the Recursive Podcast, we meet with scientist and entrepreneur Peter Tsankov, co-founder of AI company Lattice Flow. Yeah, so... Ethical aspects, I think, I mean, there's, a, of course, a lot of talking about safety, bias of the models, mm -hmm. and there's some extreme uses of AI, which I think should be regulated, and they will be. So here we're talking about, for example, mass surveillance of individuals with AI, mm -hmm. because it's just a very, a very powerful technology. So you could literally just track people and, you know, compute all kinds of, uh, all kinds of social scores, mm -hmm. you know, that sound really, really scary. If you have this and just AI can, would, can enable you to implement this, like for real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.